Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Juan, I am Just One Reader, and today I will be answering your questions regarding psychoanalysis. Now, I could make an entire YouTube channel talking about psychoanalysis, theory, practice, technique. I could ramble on and on and on, and I could make a five hour long video, but that is not my objective. That's not what we're gonna do here. In here, I'm just gonna take a look into the questions that you left here in the comment section of my previous video, and uh, I'm just gonna try to answer them to the best of my ability. Um, I will have to answer as schematically and synthetically and as, as clearly and, and simply as I can, because otherwise this video would be way too long and convoluted and, and difficult um, to make and to watch. Um, however, if by the end of this video you feel like I like there was something that I didn't really explain or something that I got wrong or something that was not very clear, something that you would like me to explain again in a different way, please let me know and I can try again or I can give you some references, some articles or some videos that you can go and watch to uh, get more information, right? So without any, any further ado, let's get started. The first question comes from Jairo Gonzalez and he wants to know, what a person, uh, what can a person expect to get from psychoanalysis in terms of actual palpable results in their lives? Many different things, Heido. Uh, psychoanalysis has the wonderful thing um, that uh, psychoanalysis has the wonderful objective of taking a look into a patient in its uniqueness, through its uniqueness. So it can give a patient what the patient needs and what the patient wants to obtain from the treatment. Now, in your question, you mentioned several things that some people might think they can get from psychoanalysis. So, for example, you talk about uh, clarifying your thoughts and your feelings. Yes, absolutely, we do that. That is very much achievable through psychoanalysis. You also talk about increasing your, uh, not increasing, uh, uh, improving your relationships with other people, your intimacy with other people and with yourself, I would add. Yes, absolutely, that's one of the key things that we do as psychoanalysts. Um, you also mention, uh, you wonder if psychoanalysis can achieve another level of consciousness. I would say not. Psychoanalysis is not bothered uh, by trying to achieve another level of consciousness. I don't even think that's really possible. And if it is possible, I don't really know if it would be useful for therapeutical reasons. However, psychoanalysis works with the level of consciousness and awareness that you already have, and it tries to expand it. So it's not so much trying to go to another level altogether. It's more trying to grow and expand and, and reach out into all the different areas of your self and of your life so that you can be more aware. The next question comes from Steve Donahue. Steve asks, um, why do psychoanalysts need to maintain a level of detachment from their patients? Um, basically, what happens, Steve, is that the psychoanalytical relationship between analyst and patient is very bizarre. It's really, really strange, and it feels almost artificial. It is not artificial, but it can feel artificial because it is very different to regular relationships that you would make, uh, that, that, that you would establish with someone else in real life. Um, so it's very weird because on the one hand, as a patient, you are incredibly close. You feel really close to your analyst. It's a very, very close, intimate bond. It's somehow a bond between uh, the, the mother and child bond, but also with your partner, but also 
with a friend. It's it's a weird kind of deal. Um, the the analyst has to remain as neutral and as detached as possible in order for the patient to project his own self and his own fantasies and his own conflicts onto the figure of the analyst. We do that as analysts so that we can then show the patient what they're doing. So um, there are certain concepts of psychoanalytical technique, transference, counter-transference, um, that we need to be very aware of as analysts to really know how to be able to work with a patient. Because let's face it, not every patient is sweet and delightful and friendly and a good person. Um, it would be very easy to work with those kinds of patients. However, there are some patients that are very violent, some patients that are incredibly anxious or depressed or voracious and needy and patients that bring out some things in the therapist that are very, very violent and very uh, difficult to manage for the therapist. So the therapist has to remain somewhat neutral and some, somewhat detached so that they can still help the patient. Um, also, I would add that the the internal conflict of the patient is resolved when, uh, when the analyst is able to understand something that we call transference and counter-transference neurosis. That is uh, a, a, a topic that uh, has been written and discussed by many analysts since Freud. Freud himself talked about this and it has been expanded upon since Freud. Um, so yeah, that is one of the reasons why uh, the bond between patient and analyst is very special and it's very close, but at the same time, it's very strange. The next question is also from Steve Donahue, and he has more, by the way. So Steve asks, are there any circumstances in which you would have a few sessions with a new client and tell them they do not need psychoanalysis? If therapy is for the sick, does modern day psychotherapy consider anybody in the world to be healthy? Okay, so the first part of that question refers to um, what makes a patient fit for analysis. Certainly, there are certain criteria that we call analyz analyzability criteria to determine if a patient is suited to psychoanalysis or if they would be better off in another treatment. So the way that we work is we have a procedure. We receive the patient the first time they contact us and we ask the patient to tell us about what it is that they are experiencing, why are they seeking treatment, and we try to, uh, to, to start understanding what's really going on internally in the patient. If we determine that the patient is suited for analysis uh, based on language, intelligence, and certain other uh, criteria, then we uh, explain to the patient uh, how we work and how we want to help them. If the patient is willing, then what we do is we have a couple of interviews with the patient in which we ask the patient a lot of questions about their life, their life history, their family history, their relationships. Uh, we, we try to get to know the patient as much as we can. And then after that, if we still think that the patient is really suited for psychoanalytical treatment, if psychoanalytical treatment is uh, a recommended uh, treatment for the patient, and we truly believe that this particular patient will benefit from this kind of treatment, then that's what we do. Um, if we see that a patient has a neurological affliction or a neurological conflict, a uh, neurochemical imbalance that they need to take care of, then we send them to a psychiatrist 
or we send them to another specialist. We can send them to a physician, we can send them to a neurologist, we can send them to another kind of therapist, um, not necessarily psychoanalytical treatment. So yeah, um, there are many ways in which psychoanalysis can help you, but if there is something else that can work, we will let you know so that you, the patient, can make a more informed decision about the treatment that you want to enter. Now, the other part of your question, my dear Steve, is about uh, this sort of construction of health and sickness for modern psychoanalysis and for psychotherapy. So for psychotherapy, there is uh, a construction of mental health and so therefore, we have a lot of diagnoses and constructions of what mental sickness is. So if you go to a psychotherapy, uh, your psychotherapy will try to make your sick parts of the personality become healthier. Um, and there are many different kinds of psychotherapy that can try to do this. However, in psychoanalysis, we do not necessarily think that way. In psychoanalysis, we understand and we accept that a person can have parts of their personality that are more disturbed or more compromised and things that they can manage better than they are now. And we try to alleviate the pain and the anxiety and the depression and all of that. However, psycho what makes psychoanalysis different to psychothera from psychotherapy is that psychoanalysis doesn't think, doesn't accept the idea that a person can be completely healthy mentally because something that we understand is that psychic conflict, inner conflict, is essential to human being. The human condition requires pain and requires frustration. Even the happiest man alive will have some degree of something, something. Um, the only way to achieve no pain, no suffering, complete happiness is death. So um, when you accept that fact, that premise, psychoanalysis becomes more human, I think. Psychoanalysis is not trying to fix you or make you a better you. It can, and it can make you a better you. However, psychoanalysis is just a way of understanding, uh, first and foremost. The next question also comes from Steve Donahue, and he says, um, you say that you yourself have been in therapy for seven years. Seven years! Are you actually saying that you need that much therapy? How can that be possible? And if it is possible, how can you possibly provide therapy for your own clients while you're in therapy yourself? Yeah, I understand that concern and I, I feel you, Steve. So there, there's a lot of things that I wanna say here. Um, firstly, I've been in I've been in analysis for seven years. It's it's been a very intensive analysis, uh, four times a week. Uh, analysis for seven years is a long time, um, and I've grown a lot as a person. However, I I am undergoing such an intensive analytical process because I am training to become a psychoanalyst myself. Being a psychoanalyst is very tricky and it's very complex because you have to understand your own conflicts and your own unconscious so that you can help someone else understand their own unconscious and their own conflicts. So it's like, um, it's like learning how to do something that you are going to be doing with your own patients, but you have to learn how to do it first by having someone, your analyst, do it with you. So am I, am I getting through here? Uh, I hope I'm making some sense out of this. Um, the regular person who seeks psychoanalytical treatment or psychotherapy um, is not in psychotherapy for seven years. I mean, 
I know some people who have been in psychoanalysis for 20 years, 30 years, and they are incredibly happy and they will never leave. However, most people go to psychoanalysis and they stay there for, I don't know, some people stay for six months and they have a very good analysis, a very successful treatment. Some people stay for a year, some people for two years, some people for a little bit longer. It all depends. Um, psychoanalysis doesn't refer to people as sick or healthy, so it's not valid to say that the longer you need the therapy, the sicker you must be. Because psychoanalysis doesn't really work just with sickness. You start analysis and the sickness or the symptoms start to recede and start to disappear. But you are still able to analyze your own life and what goes through your mind. So psychoanalysis is still working even if the symptoms are no longer there. That's wonderful. Um, that's why I am still finding out things about myself even now seven years into my analysis that I hadn't seen before. Now, um, do I really need that much therapy? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, like I say, I am a weird case because I am a psychoanalyst in training. So I do need to undergo a very long intensive analysis. That's kind of a, a requisite. That's kind of something that I have to do. Um, I will probably remain in analysis for another five to ten years and after that I will see I will probably stop or pause but I know very well that later on in life when something else presents itself another moment in my life that presents different challenges or different things different conflicts or different emotions whatever I will probably go back or, well, I don't know if I will go back, but I know that I have my own analysis already internalized. So I already have my analysis inside of me. It's already working inside of me. And Steve Donahue has another question, the last question from Steve, and he says, how is any of this quantifiable? It's not. The only way in which we can try to measure or quantify psychoanalysis is by looking at how a patient is evolving, uh, how the patient's symptoms are evolving, if they are decreasing, if the patient is feeling more contained, if the anxiety is behaving or manifesting in a different way than it did before, if the patient is feeling more adjusted and adapted. There are certain things that we can observe to see if the patient is getting better. However, psychoanalysis does not deal with quantifiable, measurable, uh, objective things. We are working with the human condition. Um, <laughs> one of my supervisors once told me that learning how to become an analyst was something like learning how to how to use the force like like the jedis how to use the force and it's weird but, but yeah it's not quantifiable it is not measurable i mean patients get better if the analysis is good if the analyst is well trained if it is a licensed analyst and a supervised analyst and a good analyst who does their job well, the patient will get better. Absolutely. I think so. Um, I think, yeah, the patient will get better. And I think that's the most uh, objectifiable, measurable thing we can get. Um, in, your, in here, you also ask me, uh, can people be cured or have a resolution? Yes, of course. People can go to analysis, for a certain specific problem, they solve that problem and they can leave and that's it. It's a successful treatment. Some other patients are more thirsty of knowledge and they want to understand themselves a little bit deeper. Uh, some people want to go as deep as they can possibly go and they will stay for longer and longer and longer. 
um, but it's not necessary if you just want to get rid of your symptoms. The next question comes from Delicious Reads. What has been your most challenging moment during a therapy session and what has been the most rewarding as a patient and as an analyst? <laughs> well, as a patient, the most rewarding thing is to see how much you can change and how happy you can actually be. Before my psychoanalysis, I was overweight, I was very depressed, I was anxious, I had a, a phobia, I was not the shining, beautiful, gorgeous human being that you have before you. <laughs> a narcissistic son of a bitch, apparently. <laughs> No, but all kidding aside, before I entered analysis, I was another person. Um, I was not, I was not severely disturbed. I was not very sick, but I had my conflicts. Um, I was not the person that I am today, not the happy person that I am today. Now, um, I, I mean, you can even look at me and I don't even look physically like that person that I was before my, my analysis. Right now, I have lost weight. Uh, because of my analysis, I started to lose weight. I started to put my life uh, in order, put everything, get my shit together. Um, I came out. I, I started to really understand and integrate and live my identity, not just sexually, but my entire identity, I understand myself better, and uh, I am, uh, I've grown so much that I, I am now capable of helping others. So that's the most rewarding thing for me as a patient. Um, as a patient, the most challenging parts of analysis are realizing your own resistances and realizing your own sickness, you have to become aware of your sickness. You have to become aware of your own narcissism and your own anxiety. And sometimes your analyst will tell you things that you really didn't want to know and that are really, really, really uh, difficult to process. So that's challenging because it implies pain, but it's a pain that helps you grow. Now, as an analyst, the most challenging thing that I have ever done as an analyst was uh, I once saw a patient who was in jail and I actually went to jail. I went into the facility and I saw the patient there at the, inside the premises. This patient was so severely disturbed he was paranoid. I think he was a, a case of a paranoid schizophrenia. So he was, he was, he was the, the most regressive patient I've ever seen. And it was awful for me. It was exhausting because I worked with the patient for about six months. And for those six months, I had nightmares. I had fantasies that I was driving and someone would break in my car and kill me, that someone would kidnap me. I had nightmares that people came into my room and they dismembered me. They caught parts of my body off. Um, I sometimes had fantasies that someone would come into my house and burn my dogs alive. Uh, very violent things, and it all connected to this patient's pathology. So that was very, very, very uh, anxiety-producing and very, very challenging. However, being an analyst is the most rewarding job I could possibly imagine uh, because you can be the, the person who facilitates all of this uh, change to someone else. You can be an instrument to really help others. And I've had my fair share of patients, some of them, uh, some of them more adapted than others. Um, but it's wonderful to see how each and one of them 
evolves and develops and grows and tries to understand better what's going on with them. Um, I've had some patients, for example, I, I, I just had a patient who just finished her analysis with me. She was with me for a year, just one year. And it was incredible because she was able to control her bulimia, her eating disorder, her anxiety, her relationships with men, uh, her self-esteem, her relationships with her mother and uh, with her family overall. It was a lot of change for one year of analysis. So it's very rewarding. It's an incredibly rewarding job. It has its frustrations, but it is also incredibly joyful and rewarding. The next question comes from Parla Bain is back. They want to know um, how psychoanalysis works. How can you know that psychoanalysis really works and what the success rate is? So psychoanalysis doesn't work like other treatments, like I mentioned. It doesn't work like other psychotherapies. It doesn't work like a medical treatment. It doesn't work uh, in that sort of obvious cause effect way. Um, you can see the results and you can see that psychoanalysis works because you start seeing changes in the person. You start to see how the symptoms recede and how the patient becomes uh, more effective in the way they manage th themselves and also how they adjust and, 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 and work with their environment. That's how you can see the, the progress of the patient. Um, you also ask um, uh, if there will ever be artificial intelligence counselors. I think maybe we will see artificial intelligence therapists because therapy is all about providing solutions to problems. And I would assume that you can program a machine to do that. I don't know how, but maybe that would be possible. However, psychoanalysis is completely incompatible with machines. Um, there can never be artificial intelligence psychoanalysts because machines, robots, however intelligent they can be, they don't have an unconscious, they don't have fantasies, they don't have dreams, they don't have uh, the very particular use of language that we have, the spontaneous uh, language that we have, they don't have uh, a lot of things that make us human. Psychoanalysis, after all, if I had to summarize what psychoanalysis is, I would say that psychoanalysis is the study of the most human parts of the human. It's what makes us human in the first place. And robots, machines, however advanced, they will never have that. They will never have those things that we do have. So no, no IA counsel, uh, psychoanalysts. Another question that you have is if psychoanalysts have to learn how to hypnotize people. No. Hypnosis is no longer accepted. It's no longer uh, well regarded. Honestly, hypnosis is a very valid technique in meditation and relaxation and suggestion. However, psychoanalysis doesn't work like that. Freud himself tried to use hypnosis for uh, some time, but he realized that it was not helping and that it was it was not working because hypnosis doesn't, the effect of hypnosis doesn't come from the patient. It comes from the person who hypnotizes you. And that is exactly the opposite of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is uh, the patient tr has to be able to understand what they are doing. So psychoanalysis empowers the patient. It makes the patient responsible and empowered with everything, all the scary things that that entails. 
So hypnosis doesn't do that. Hypnosis is the opposite of that. So hypno hypnosis is not psychoanalytical treatment at all. Finally, the last question comes from Eddie D. Eddie wants to know um, if as a book critic, I review uh, the characters from a book the way that I would analyze a patient. Uh, he says, do you analyze characters as you would if they were lying on the, on the couch or do you treat them in a more visceral way as most readers probably do? Well, when we are studying literature, when we are reading, uh, we cannot really perform our psychoanalytical function because, well, because it's not a real person. It's a fictional character. Um, of course, there are some characters that we can use to understand certain things, certain pathologies, um, certain ideas, certain conflicts, um, but it's all fictional. So we can use that li like an artifice, uh, like a learning device, maybe like a metaphor, like a symbol, but I never analyze characters as I would analyze a real person because it's not a real person. Um, what is also very interesting is to see or to wonder if the characters tell you something about the author. <laughs> That's very interesting. I don't know. I don't know if I have the answers to that. All I can say, Eddie, is that I never analyze characters the way that I would analyze a patient, simply because they are not patients, uh, because they're not real people. Um, it's like I would never analyze someone who is not my patient. Even if it is, you know, my friend or my father or my brother or someone that I know really well, I would never analyze them because they are not my patients. Um, even if they are real people, I would never analyze them because it's completely taken out of context. It's, it's completely... Uh, weird to analyze that. Analysis is something that can only ever happen inside the consulting room between yourself and your patient. It's a very, very strange, beautiful relationship that happens between a patient and their analyst. So it's, it's, it's not, you cannot do it outside of that relationship. Guys, thank you very much as always for watching. Uh, leave your comments down below if you have more questions that you would like for me to answer. Um, and I will see you on the next video. Thanks for watching.